Raise your hand if you're a parent. Ah. Think about the walls that you would walk through to fulfill the commitment you had made to your children. Because at that moment, John's two daughters reminded him of the commitment he had made to them prior to living for Everest. You see, prior to living for Everest, he had promised his two daughters he would not die on Everest. He'd come back. He would climb with them. He would adventure with them. He would be with them. And while we were panicking, they were completely calm. They said, Daddy, don't you forget your promise. We love you, and we want you to come home. And for the first time in 20 minutes, John McIsaac started to move. You could see him groping in the snow for his ice axe. He finds it, he grabs it, he pushes down on it, he teeters to his feet, takes a couple steps, boom, falls down in the snow. His girls come right back and they're ready to him. Daddy, we love you. When are you going to be home? Now, we have all heard the words, when are you going to be home? But in that case, they certainly had more presence and very definitely more power. Because it was almost like they reached down from that satellite in space, they grabbed their dad by the harness, they hauled him out of the snow, and ever so gently, they ushered him onwards. Because six hours after John McIsaac reached his high point, he crawled, quite literally crawled, back into our high camp at 26,000 feet. We heard he was met by our team physician, Dr. Dennis Brown, the gym on the left-hand side of the photograph here. Now, we asked Dennis to quantify, on a scale of 1 to 10, the severity of John's condition. 1 being fine, 10 being deaf. Dennis said 9. 9. So 30 seconds later, we did launch a full-blown Hildy to rescue. We slapped on our emergency oxygen. We headed up the hillside towards Johnny and, and Dennis. We met them at 26,000 feet, and we began to shepherd them and Johnny down the mountain. So Johnny's on the, on the, on the uh, snow here. To his left is Dennis with the blue gloves, and I'm in the blue parka. Unfortunately, four hours into the rescue, John McIsaac fell unconscious. His pulse and breathing became erratic. erratic. Remember, he actually started to froth at the mouth as the liquid in his lungs started to bubble up into his mouth. Now, we weren't sure whether he was alive or dead, but we decided to continue with rescue anyway, so we did. We loaded him into a harness, into a sleeping bag. We then began to lower him down the 2,000-foot face of the North Coast Slope, hour after hour after hour. It took us 33 continuous hours. It was the hardest physical thing I have ever done before climbing back from cancer. In the end, most of us were staggering and, and stumbling, and some of us couldn't even speak. And we surrendered this limp form of the body to a team of physicians who had assembled in our makeshift hospital in advanced base camp. They went to work on John at that moment. I said goodnight to him, and I said goodbye to him too. Because I was sure I would never see him alive again. But I was wrong. Because six hours later, John McIsaac regained consciousness. He started to sit up, talk in a faint whisper. Two days after we took that photograph, we took this photograph. Two days after we took that photograph, John McIsaac, a man who for sure had one foot and then some in a grave, walked under his own steam back to base camp. 